Two weeks ago, we did host Vacation Bible School here. Every hallway was filled with energy and roar and children running, and it was great fun. Part of the fun for me is that our grandchildren were in town that week. Cooper, age five, was in Vacation Bible School. His dad was traveling for work, which meant that uh, my daughter Haley and uh, now three-month-old Lucy were at our house too. It was a fun week at the Hollingsworths. Having them in town at our house also meant that Uncle Brendan made his way over after work to play outside with Cooper and to get to fight me to see who holds Lucy. So with Father's Day approaching, I was more aware than ever of the gift of three generations of us playing together but also because of this sermon, I was also aware and watching and appreciating where we are developmentally. You see, Cooper still needs a lot of rules. At age five, you've got to have a lot of rules. Cooper, do not eat cherries out of the jar on the sofa. <laughs> Go to the table, get a napkin. Cooper, it's time for bed. Let's put on pajamas, brush teeth. We'll read a book before bedtime. He needs clear direction rules. And across the room is Cooper's Uncle B. That's what he calls Brendan. And I recall saying the same things to Brendan at age five. Brendan, don't bounce on the sofa with your nasty shoes on. Rules were important. But now I'm presuming a lot. Brendan's 29 now. I'm guessing he goes to bed at a reasonable hour. I'm, I'm guessing he brushes his teeth without being told. I'm guessing he reads by himself, and I'm guessing that he now takes his shoes off before he bounces on the sofa. <laughs> he doesn't need the rules imposed on him because he's mature. And the, the day he came over uh, to play with Cooper and Lucy, he called his mother on the way and said, do I need to stop and pick up pizza on my way to your house after work? As rules fall away, we become free to love. And then last week, Saturday till yesterday, I was on vacation with my dad and extended family, my sisters, their families, 17 of us at one, in one house at the beach. Now I'm watching four generations of us together, and I reflected on my relationship with my dad and my need for rules at an earlier time. By, by the way, I found out um, even though it looks low, you can't take a lawnmower across AstroTurf in the backyard. It doesn't work. It pulls it up. It, a rule would have been helpful then. I learned a bad lesson. I needed rules. When I was a teenager, the rule was we would be home by 9 o'clock or we would call and explain. But we were at a haunted house at Halloween before cell phones. There was no way to call. I opened the front door quietly at 1.15, hoping I might avoid any trouble. I closed it quietly behind me, and I heard my dad say, Good morning, Doc which is when I knew this was not going to end well. I had rules, I needed rules, I wasn't mature enough yet to make good decisions without rules. But eventually, the rules fell away. Now my dad treats me as a grown-up. And when the rules fall away, we become free to love. Which is the point that the Apostle Paul is making in these verses of Galatians. This letter that's often called the Magna Carta of Christian Liberty. You remember, and, and I mentioned this in a sermon just a few weeks ago, that one of the great challenges of the early church was whether or not all Christ followers must become Jewish, become followers of the law before they could become Christians. At first, all Christians were Jewish, but then Gentiles started professing their faith in Jesus, and it raised serious questions about whether or not you could really be a Christian without following the law of Moses. In our passage today, Paul is weighing in on that subject exactly. And for Paul, there are three distinct eras with regard to the law. 
and he is declaring that a new era has begun. There was a time before the law, the era between Abraham and Moses, before God wrote the ten laws on a stone tablet. Then there was the era of the law, the era from Moses to Jesus, when adherence to the law was the mark of a person's faithfulness. And finally, for Paul, there is the era of Jesus, a new era that has begun with the crucifixion and resurrection. And so in this letter to the Galatians, Paul declares the value of the law. It's a good set of rules for people who need rules. But now it's time to live as grown-ups. The Jewish people had and needed the law, but Dad is now ready to treat you as a grown-up. Eventually, we become free to love, and the rules fall away. Paul says, therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. The law is important. The law exposes our selfishness, guides us in right paths, but the law cannot make us holy. You know, you can follow the law to the letter and not have a change of heart at all. When I was a teenager, I was, um, I was a lifeguard at the Dorval City Pool. I grew up in Dorval. Y'all might know where that pool is. It's just down the hill uh, from the Dorval Marta Station there. And from ages 15 to 20, I spent every summer in the Dorval Sun. Well, the manager who hired me was older. She didn't know any teenagers to hire, so she told me, Bring me some people to interview to hire. So all of my buddies from school and my buddies from church, and it just became a whole group of my buddies working at the pool every summer. It was great fun. But then I became the manager. And that was not as much fun because these are my buddies and I'm the manager and you know how that goes. So when they would break the rules, they would keep me out of it. And one of the city, one of the steadfast rules of the city pool was no swimming after hours, for obvious reasons. Night swimming was a dangerous prospect, so after the pool closed and and the chain lock was bound, nobody was allowed to go swimming. But a group of my friends who were working there, many of them had the key. One night, they keyed in, had a little private party at the pool. But out of respect for me, And out of respect for the rules, they made a pact that they wouldn't do any swimming. Because you see, no swimming after hours is allowed. So they got in and they just kind of waited and paddled. (laughs) No swimming, no swimming. They come off the diving board and reach for a friend's hand. Will you pull me to the side? I can't swim. You know, there's no swimming after hours. If, re- if confronted, they won't be able to say with a clear conscience, we didn't go swimming, I promise. You can keep the law. In so many areas, you can keep the law and have no change of heart at all. Jesus talked about this when he talked about the limits of the law on the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, he talked about how you can keep the law and no change of heart at all. You have heard it was said of those of ancient times, you shall not murder. But I say to you, if you're angry with a brother or sister. You see, the law says don't kill, but you can keep the law. You can never murder a soul. You can be blameless under the law, but still be a hate-filled tyrant full of bigotry and bile. Jesus wants a heart change to love. You've heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to everyone who looks at a woman that way. I mean, the law itself might keep you out of the Motel 6, but your passions are anything but redeemed. Jesus wants a heart changed by love. 
We didn't key in and go swimming. I promise. Well, you can keep the law with no change of heart at all. The law is good. The law keeps a five-year-old from touching the stove. It keeps a teenager checking in in the evening. It keeps the toys picked up in the playroom. But the law alone can never motivate goodness. The law can't move a person to holiness. The law can be obeyed to the letter and not keep a person from being selfish or bigoted or closed off from love. The Apostle Paul told the Christians meeting in Galatia, Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. Law is a good tutor, but once the people of God have come of age, love is the rule. When dad's ready to treat you as a grown-up, the rules are not so important. What is important is that you have the tools to transform your inner life into a sanctuary of God's holiness and that you have the habits of love that treat other people as you would like to be treated without distinction. But it's so much easier to just know the rules, to just... Obey the rule. Just give me the rule. Grown-up faith requires us to make decisions. Is it okay to break the speed limit to get somebody to the hospital? Grown-up faith requires more than just following the rules. Ethicist Paul Fletcher wrote a really controversial book in 1966 called Situation Ethics. According to Fletcher, all laws and principles and ideals and norms are only contingent, only valid if they happen to serve love. His litmus test, what is the most loving thing to do in this situation? I don't know if this story is actually true, but I heard it as true. I heard that he was going, to, uh, soon after that book was published, he was going to Southern Seminary to have a debate with Henley Barnett, who was the ethicist at Southern Seminary. And, so, and, and in their opening statements, Dr. Barnett said, Dr. Fletcher, my wife and I were discussing this debate earlier, and she concluded that the most loving thing for you to do would be to lose. I think that's great. The rules are easier than following the rule of love. But obedience to the law will never liberate the human heart. Following the rule is the right course until we gain the habits and the heart to transform. It's when we fall in love with the way of Christ, his liberal loving spirit, and desire to be transformed into agents of that love that we become grown-ups in the faith. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. Or in the words of theologian Paul Tillich, love is the ultimate law. According to the Apostle Paul, a new era has begun, a new people formed. We are baptized into Christ, dripping wet with our new identity, clothed with Christ, wearing our new personhood from head to toe. Now remember, the, the original argument that Paul is addressing here has to do with whether or not Gentile believers could be Christians without being Jewish. Could they be Christians without following the law of Moses? Do, do Gentiles need to keep kosher? Are Gentile Christians subject to the purification laws and all the rest? Well, well as we've already noted, Paul weighs in on that original debate. But then he goes even further, so much further than anybody's comfortable with. He says, there is no longer Jew or Greek. That should have settled it. That was the original debate. But then he pushes it. There is no longer slave or free. 
There's no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. When love rules, there are no distinctions. You see, there used to be rules under the law. There were rules that made distinctions between Jews and Gentiles. Jews, Gentiles here, that's gone. There were rules that made distinctions between free people and slaves. Free people, slaves here, gone. There were rules that had men higher than women. That's the way the rules used to be. Paul said, that's that's gone. There might have been rules during that second era that might have stood before you were grown-ups, but we are now in the era of the risen Christ, and it is a new day. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. All of you are one in Christ Jesus. In Christ, a new people being formed. I was at a dinner party some months ago, a beautiful Buckhead home, lawyer friend of mine. Dinner was over. We went into the den. We're visiting, having a nice time. Beautiful place. We, we said something about how lovely his home was. And he said, thank you, as you would expect him to. But then he said something we didn't expect at all. He actually got vulnerable with us for a minute. And before I tell you what he said, let me point out that this wasn't a church gathering. I mean, this is it's a dinner party, but they're, uh, you know, they're Medes and Elamites and dwellers of Mesopotamia and all of that around at this dinner party, right? And he said, this beautiful home used to matter to me more than it does now. He said, my dad is a retired rural pastor, and we never lived in a place that was anything like this when I was growing up. But the older I get, the more I want to be like my dad. And my idea of success isn't cutting it anymore. My dad is the most generous, most loving, most inclusive person I know And that's what I aspire to be. He said, the last time I was with him, he said, he's 80. And the last time I was with him, he said to me, at age 80, I'm starting to understand the gospel. He's still trying to grow into the person that he aspires to be. I want the second half of my life to be more like that than like this. When rules fall away, you're free to love. When your world is no longer divided into Jews and Greeks and males and females and Democrats and Republicans and us and them and slave and free, when love is the ultimate law of your life, you might be about halfway to being fully mature in Christ Jesus. What do you need to do next? to grow in your own maturity in the likeness of Christ. Would you consider that as we stand and sing?